sets are pretty important to logic and maths and depending on whose view you take also to philosophy particularly if you're thinking about metaphysics and philosophy of language. So it will be good to know to understand what sets are. Okay let's talk about that. Hello everyone, welcome to The Attic. My name's Mark Jago, I'm a philosopher in the UK. I've been doing a few videos on set theory and using sets in logic. In this video, I wanna have a quick think about what sets are and how we can understand that concept of a set and some of the problems that get in the way of a simple and easy understanding of what sets are. Okay, so if that sounds good to you, do me a favor before we get going, give this video a thumbs up, hit subscribe, join the channel. That all helps me to get these videos out to more people on YouTube. I just wanna talk a little bit more about the concept of a set, like what is a set? So I start with the idea that a set is a collection and that is, that is roughly right. We should definitely have that idea in mind when we're thinking about what a set is, but it can't quite be like that because Think about this thing that I'm going to write down. I want the collection of things X such that X is a set. Sets are objects, so I should be able to collect them together using my set comprehension notation and get a set of those things. But if we try and do that, we get a problem because this thing here is trying to be a set that collects together all the sets and that's going to include itself. So it's going to be a collection that includes itself. And that's something that we can't do. At least in most set theories, we don't want to allow a set to include itself. Okay, so if sets can't include themselves, then there's going to be no set of all sets. That kind of backs off from the idea that a set is a collection, because it means that sometimes I can have some things, like the sets, but I can't collect them together. In a way, there are too many sets for them to be collected together. Now, this problem isn't to do with infinity. I, I can collect together infinitely many things. I mean, I can't literally do that, but the, the concept of a set allows me to form sets of infinitely many things. Numbers, natural numbers, I can collect them together fine. Real numbers, I can't even count the real numbers. They're not enumerable, but you can have a set of real numbers. There is the set of real numbers. So it's not just the fact that there's infinitely many sets that means we can't collect them together. But often you will hear people say, you know, there's just too many sets. The, the size of the infinity is just way too much, such that if we try to collect the sets together, we get paradoxes. People have tried to formulate different set theories that allow us to do this, or they talk about proper classes or whatever. Let's not go into all of that. It's just worth knowing that in standard set theories, you can't have a set of all sets. And that kind of some, to some degree, makes a step back from the idea that a set is simply a collection of things. But there's actually a bigger paradox that goes on here when we start writing out sets, or we try to form sets using some condition in set comprehension notation. So we're going to try to collect together all of the things that aren't members of themselves. And that's actually going to turn out to be impossible to do. So let's think about, should we include this set here, the very one that we're trying to form? OK, if we do include it, that's because it satisfies this description. It's not a member of itself. But then we include it in the set, so it would be a member of itself. OK, so if it's not a member of itself, it is a member of itself and we've got a contradiction. So let's say, OK, we're not going to include it. But if we don't include this set, then it satisfies this description. It's not a member of itself, so we should include it. OK, so either way, we've got a contradiction. If we try to collect together all the sets that aren't members of themselves, we get a contradiction. What we've been kind of looking at here is what's sometimes called naive set theory. The idea that any condition I write down on the right here defines a set for me. So I write down a logical condition and bang, I've got a set. We've just kind of run through the standard argument that says that can't be right. Some conditions don't give you sets because, as it were, if they do, you would get a contradiction from it. So this naive, this basic idea of a set as a collection of things given by a logical condition doesn't really work very well. Or at least it doesn't work well in classical logic because it gives you a contradiction. 
some people more recently have tried to rehabilitate naive set theory, this, this very basic notion of a set simply as a collection of things specified with a condition, in a paraconsistent logic. That is a logic that allows for contradictions. So you go, yep, we've got a set of all things, uh, we've got a set of all sets, we've got a set of sets that doesn't contain itself. That's fine, because we can have it both containing itself and not containing itself if we are dialethists, if we allow for things to be both true and false so that contradictions don't make things go crazy. Okay, if you're not quite sure what I'm on about, there's a, a link to a video up here. But for now, we're going to stick with classical logic, okay, because that's what most mathematicians did kind of throughout the 20th century. So they found this problem in naive set theory and they realized you know, we need a better theory. So what they came up with is this cumulative or iterative idea of a set. And the idea is you start off with some stuff that isn't sets, like people or whatever, and you collect them together. And then you collect together all the sets that you've just made. That gives you some new sets. And then you collect together all of those. That gives you some new sets. And you keep on collecting and you keep going and you keep going. And, you know, you say there's going to be at least infinitely many of, of those going up and up and up and you basically never stop. That's the set theoretic hierarchy. And set theory, when people talk about set theory, they're talking about a theory that governs the construction and behavior of that hierarchy. Often, when we're doing set theory, like as an area of maths, we don't do the collecting people or collecting chairs and tables or whatever. We just do pure sets, okay? So when we're doing pure sets, we don't start off with anything. So we have on the first level of that hierarchy, the empty set. That's our starting point. And then we build from there. So the set containing the empty set. And then we build and we build and we build. And we get from that basic starting point, infinitely many sets. And then bigger and bigger and bigger infinities, okay? And the system for dealing with all of that is set theory, sometimes called ZF set theory. That's kind of the modern version of set theory. There are a whole bunch of different alternative set theories out there, but pretty much when anyone's talking about set theory and they're not specifying which they mean, they mean ZF, Zamilo Frankel set theory. Or maybe they mean ZFC, that is ZF plus the axiom of choice, but you know, I'm not going to go into what all that is here. Okay, guys, so there are a few thoughts on this pretty difficult issue of what sets are supposed to be. We've got this kind of basic concept that kind of gets us into the ballpark, but when we go deeper into the idea, really there's no simple answer to the question of what sets are. Nevertheless, I think we can understand them well enough to be able to use them. So I hope you found this video useful. If you have, why not give it a thumbs up? That helps me to get this stuff out to more people on YouTube. If you're enjoying this stuff, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell icon to get updates, and I hope to see you back for the next one.